Okay, welcome everyone to this presentation. Uh, I have just started the recording and those of you participating will not be shown in the recording unless you will participate in asking questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, Axel will now present his thesis, full-scale investigation of the effects of wind turbulence, characteristics on dynamic behavior of long-span cable-supported bridges in complex terrain. Uh, so I give the word to you, Axel. Yes, thank you, Kirsti. Uh, so, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, one-hour webinar on bridge dynamics. Uh, I'm Axel Fenerji uh, from the Structural Dynamics Group uh, at NTNU. And uh, I'm also working with the uh, E39 uh, project. And uh, this is... Uh, this is the exact same uh, presentation I used uh, in my PhD defense uh, about more or less 10 days ago. I uh, defended my uh, thesis, so uh, I will use the exact same presentation. It took about 45 minutes uh, last time, so I guess it will uh, be around the same. So, yeah, I'll start now. Uh, I have uh, a long title here, but uh, we're going to look at turbulence effects uh, on long span bridges, uh, in particular uh, the hard anger bridge and the full scale measurements there. So, here I have an outline. Uh, we have, uh, we will start with an introduction. Uh, I'll try to uh, uh, explain the motivation of the study and uh, set some objectives and then I will talk about the hard anger bridge monitoring project this is uh, the core of this PhD study we've been conducting uh, full-scale measurements on the hard anger bridge I'll talk about the bridge a little bit and uh, and, the, and the project uh, then uh, since the thesis is uh, divided into papers. Uh, I have uh, five papers here. You can think of these as uh, chapters, basically. Uh, so in the first part, we're going to have a look at the wind response relationship at the bridge, but uh, from a statistical point of view. Then we will look at the effect of turbulence variability uh, on the bridge dynamics and uh, we will also do some analytical predictions. Uh, then uh, papers three and four, I combine them here, uh, and these are con these concern uh, uh, the comparisons between measurements uh, we did and the analysis, the analytical uh, predictions. And uh, lastly, we will try to devise a probabilistic uh, turbulence model and discuss. Uh, discuss the uses of that and then I will conclude the presentation so you can ask questions so uh, first uh, start let's start with the introduction uh, the motivation uh, of this study is I think uh, uh, for me there's a global motivation and a local motivation or a motivation for Norway I'll start with the global one uh, so this is sort of obvious, but uh, the world population is increasing, the economy uh, around the world is growing, and the demand for long span bridges uh, in increase. So here, for example, uh, there's a plot uh, showing the uh, all the suspension bridges built uh, from uh, 1800s uh, until today and you see a very uh, uh, distinct increase uh, in the last 30 50 years and uh, we have this uh, span length limit uh, for now sort of uh, around uh, 1.5 to 2 kilometers but uh, the, the demand is uh, clear and uh, it is increasing so 
since they are uh, being built so commonly, uh, we need safe and cost-efficient design of these uh, structures. Uh, we have also a local motivation for uh, a motivation for Norway, and this is uh, pretty much the ferry-free E39 coastal highway project. And uh, uh, to summarize this, uh, this is the E39 uh, highway, and uh, right now there are uh, many ferry connections on it, and we want to replace them all by uh, bridges or fixed links. So you can see that uh, many options are uh, being considered, such as um, floating suspension bridges or floating bridges or very long span uh, bridges. So these are uh, very expensive structures and uh, uh, and uh, the dynamics, the behavior of them uh, should be very carefully handled. So here uh, is a list of the E39 uh, bridge uh, fjord crossings. And these are, uh, as you can see, mostly uh, longer than the longest suspension bridge in the world. So uh, this, uh, this is quite a fascinating problem. Uh, and most of the fjords are wide and deep. Uh, you have complex mountainous terrain uh, of the Norwegian fjords. On top of that, you have uh, strong European windstorms uh, hitting this area. And this will uh, create vibrations due to turbulence, and uh, it should be carefully handled. So the, the question is uh, basically how well we can model the effects of turbulence uh, on, these, uh, on these enormous structures. And I have a couple of objectives listed here. Uh, so first of all, we want to do full-scale measurements on the Hard Hardanger Bridge, uh, so that we uh, we see what happens in real life. Uh, do we do we see the behavior uh, that we expect to see? Uh, also, we want to investigate the wind characteristics in the region because it is. Um, it is a particular terrain, and the wind characteristics are uh, quite special to the region. Uh, are the current models uh, we use enough uh, to describe it? Uh, we also want to study the effects of uh, these turbulence characteristics uh, on the response by uh, looking at the measurements and also uh, analytical predictions and, uh, and comparing them. Then uh, we also aim to suggest a probabilistic description uh, of turbulence. So uh, now I can talk a bit about uh, the monitoring project also. Uh, first of all, the Hardanger Bridge. It is, uh, it is the longest suspension bridge in Norway. Uh, it has a main span. It's, it's a single span bridge. You can see. Uh, clear picture here. It's uh, around 1.3 kilometers uh, long, this main span. And it is uh, located here. Uh, it is uh, around a two-hour uh, drive uh, from the city, Norwegian city, Bergen. So it's still in the Norwegian fjords and uh, western coast of Norway. Uh, and it is uh, it is in a similar location uh, as the future E39 bridges. <clears throat> and uh, it is surrounded by mountains, uh, especially from the north and south. You can, uh, you can already see uh, the foothills of the mountains. These are very uh, tall. And it is subjected to uh, strong winds. Uh, it is supported by two main cables uh, and 130 hangars and the towers that you can see here uh, they reach up to 200 meters and we have a monitoring system installed on it we have uh, 20 accelerometers uh, these are located uh, mainly in the inside the bridge girder uh, you can see uh, here and also we have two here uh, and here uh, at the tower tops. 
we have nine nanometers and these are attached to the hangers of the bridge uh, they are reaching uh, reaching out from the hangers and uh, exposed to the winds directly uh, and these are connected to uh, data logger units which are also inside the bridge girder and these are connected to wireless uh, Wi-Fi antennas and these antennas uh, provide communication between the data loggers uh, with a main data logger which is uh, located here on top of the Wallavik tower and uh, from that uh, point on uh, with an internet connection uh, we get the data here uh, at Antenu so this is how the monitoring system works and uh, now uh, we can move on to uh, the results uh, and the papers. Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, we will look at the wind response relationship uh, from a statistical point of view. So uh, in this paper, what we did is uh, we, uh, we evaluated the wind characteristics uh, from uh, on bridge measurements, so using the measurement system. And uh, we also uh, gathered the data uh, concerning the acceleration measurements, which is the dynamic response of the bridge. And we conducted a statistical analysis uh, to, uh, to investigate the relationship uh, between that and them. And we, we, uh, we observed a lot of uh, variability, a lot of randomness uh, in the wind field data and we uh, we have some comments on that so first it is uh, it, it is beneficial to look at the local topography uh, because this uh, has a large effect on the turbulence characteristics and also the dynamic response of the bridge uh, so here uh, here is the hardanger bridge uh, and the topography uh, surrounding it is, as you can see, very complex. You have uh, mountains reaching uh, up to one kilometers uh, high, 1,600 meters uh, on the east, and uh, these uh, these affect the wind conditions quite a bit. Uh, here are the views uh, from the mid middle of the bridge towards east and the west, and um, you can see that these mountains are very steep uh, and very tall and this influences the turbulence characteristics uh, so now we can uh, we can look at the wind data uh, a little so, to see how uh, it is affecting and uh, how, how are the conditions on the bridge so here i plotted the mean wind speed uh, this plot sort of shows the wind direction and the mean wind speed uh, of all the 10 minute recordings so you have uh, you have these dots uh, here and every dot is a 10 minute recording so uh, what we see uh, from this is that we have uh, two main directions uh, you have the easterly winds uh, coming from here and you have the westerly winds and these are uh, these are bounded uh, sort of uh, by the mountains so the, the directional range is sort of uh, predetermined uh, and you can see that also from the west we have uh, higher wind speeds but from the east it is sort of bounded uh, but uh, it is uh, not exceeding that much uh, the 18 meters per second or so and here uh, this was the highest uh, that we have measured it's around 30 meters per second uh, which is uh, almost uh, 100 kilometers per hour and uh, yeah this is the mean wind speed so we can do the same uh, same thing uh, for the turbulence intensity here i plotted the along wind turbulence and vertical turbulence 
Uh, and what we see here is that, uh, first of all, we see a lot of scatter, uh, a lot of uh, randomness. So it's it's hard to say uh, what uh, kind of uh, turbulence intensity you have uh, on the bridge, even for quite strong winds. Uh, uh, so the red color, for example, here is winds above 18 meters per second. So th these are these are quite high uh, wind speeds, so you don't expect any. Uh, you don't expect much uh, non-stationarities or the effects of uh, atmospheric uh, stability uh, here, but you have uh, quite a bit of a range here. So the variation for the strong winds was around 10 to 30 percent. Uh, for the long wind component and for the vertical it was around 2 to 15 percent so this is uh, this is quite a bit of uh, variability uh, in the data and this should be uh, handled uh, with care and uh, it is a concern how to model this uh, so we can look at the integral length scales uh, the same way and we, we we use two methods here and there's uh, there we observe the same things you can see the terrain effects you have higher length scales along the fjord and uh, one particular thing is uh, length scales are very very much scattered uh, that is for sure but also there's a problem uh, that it that if you use different methods, you get different uh, estimates. So even if the patterns look similar here, you have uh, a systematic uh, scale problem uh, between uh, these two methods. I'm not going to go into detail here, but uh, uh, that is just uh, uh, what I want to say. There's this uh, high randomness and scale problem uh, or discrepancy between different methods. So the same for uh, the vertical component as well. Uh, you still uh, see the scale problem. Now, uh, since we have seen the wind data, we can also look at the dynamic response. And here I plotted the uh, root mean square accelerations, the lateral acceleration, vertical and torsional accelerations. And again, uh, similar to the wind characteristics, you can see that uh, this is very scattered data. So normally, if you calculate uh, your analytical response, you would get a single line, uh, single curve here, but you get enormous scatter in all of the components. This is a particular behavior uh, for the torsional acceleration. And this, uh, as far as we believe, this is due to the turbulence effects also. So we, in summary, we see a significant variability and dynamic response. And uh, we think this is due to, due to the wind effects, especially the turbulence effects. So to investigate that, we uh, used something called the response surface analysis. This is basically a good old uh, linear regression, but instead of uh, fitting a regression curve, you fit a quadratic surface to your multi-variable, multi-dimensional data. Uh, this is the equation of the surface, and uh, by fitting that, you estimate the coefficients, uh, beta coefficients here, uh, by at least squares approximation. You, so we uh, we selected uh, our predictor variables here as uh, wind-related variables, and these are mean wind speed, turbulence, standard deviations, length scales, uh, the wind yaw angle. This is for uh, accounting for the wind direction. The vertical angle of attack, uh, the standard deviation of mean wind speed along the bridge, and this is for accounting for the non-homogeneous uh, uh, wind effects, and also the decay coefficients for uh, the coherence. And for the response variables, we selected 
root mean square acceleration responses, um, the ones that I showed you earlier. But these are the lateral, vertical, and torsional uh, components. And this is what we got. Uh, so this is the response surface fit. And so this is the response predicted by the response surface fit and uh, the measure of the response. So the, 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 there's quite a good uh, correspondence. You can model, uh, mo model most of the variability uh, with this. You can see the R square values. This is again uh, similar to re linear regression that it is uh, close to one so we we explain so this is what that means uh, we can explain most of the variability just by using wind related uh, parameters and this implies that the variability we see in the response is actually due to wind so I want to say a few things about this uh, response surface analysis method. It's a powerful tool for sure, uh, but it uh, should be handled with care because you, you don't have any physical model uh, anymore. So you have to always consider uh, uh, if it's physically uh, reasonable uh, what your findings are. So you can you can do hypothesis tests to determine the significance of different terms, and this helps uh, finding out uh, which term is actually influencing the response in the, in our case. And for example, you can you can use uh, such plots to further investigate the effect of uh, parameters and the interaction of parameters and how they influence uh, your response. So this is the end of uh, this paper. And uh, if we summarize our main findings, we saw a, a considerable variability in the response, and this is due to wind. We uh, we detected also high response uh, also under skew winds. I haven't uh, mentioned this, but, but this is also was an important finding uh, from the measurements. Uh, mean wind speed and turbulence intensity components were the most important ones influencing the response. Vertical turbulence especially was important for all of the response components. And the spend mass correlation uh, was associated with higher bridge response uh, except uh, for torsion. Now I'm uh, moving on to the next paper. So here uh, our aim is to see if the findings of the paper one, so the variability uh, we saw in the in the response and in the in the wind characteristics, if this agrees with the design methodology we have. So we conducted analytical predictions for this, and we used the design design spectra uh, from the design codes, and uh, we investigated the effect of turbulence variability. So first, a summary of uh, how we normally design against buffeting actions, and uh, this this always require a good representation of the buffeting loading. Uh, so you have uh, some input here. You have the wind field uh, inputs, and this is uh, mostly a power spectral density of turbulence. These can be um, uh, some uh, code formulations, uh, and it, uh, they, they typically have deterministic wind-related parameters, such as length scales, turbulence intensities, and these are estimated uh, either through mass measurements or terrain model, uh, terrain models or, uh, or directly empirical uh, code formulas. You have your structural and model properties, and these are uh, typically obtained with a finite element model. And you have also wind tunnel data, and these uh, give you the static load coefficients, aerodynamic uh, derivatives, and admittance functions. And using these, you uh, you solve your equation of motion, and you get the dynamic response. 
then we uh, then we typically move on uh, with the structural design. So if you look at, for example, uh, N400, the Norwegian handbook for bridge design, uh, the, esti the estimation of the wind characteristics, they require uh, field measurements for uh, spans longer than 300 meters. Uh, but uh, in, uh, despite of this, uh, they, uh, they have the mean wind speed as, a, as the only design parameter and the other uh, turbulence parameters such as turbulence intensities, length scales, one point and uh, two point spectra, these are deterministic. So these are functions of uh, height from height above the ground or mean wind speed. So if you, you use these uh, use these variables, you get response curves, uh, these nice curves uh, uh, like these ones. But as we as we saw in the first paper, what we observe is much more uh, much more scattered and complex. So if we have another look uh, on the wind characteristics, but this time uh, from a probability distribution point of view. Uh, so we have the turbulence intensity, one point spectra, and uh, here the, 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 we model this with a coefficient. Uh, spectral coefficient here and the normalized co spectra and here you have uh, the k coefficient this is uh, called the uh, decay coefficient uh, also so if we use these parameters to describe the wind characteristics we see that these are these follow uh, distributions probability distributions i'm sorry yeah these follow probability distributions and uh, these are fairly uh, Rep can be fairly represented by uh, log normal uh, distributions. So we can say that these are log normally distributed uh, random variables. And if we also have a look at the response uh, uh, in a similar fashion, so this is again the root mean square acceleration response at the mid span. And again, we see that the response. Uh, also has a distribution for a certain wind speed, for example, if you see that, uh, if you take a cut here, you can see that this is also uh, possible to be represented by a log normal distribution. So here you can see uh, how the scatter is, uh, is distributed. So the wind characteristics uh, and uh, the response also follow similar uh, similar distributions and if we then we calculated the, uh, the dynamic response we use multi-mode theory in frequency domain we got the model properties from a finite element model uh, we use the wind tunnel data of Shijako et al uh, we uh, we, then we used four different wind fields. So first one is N400. This is the direct use of the code spectra. Uh, the other is design basis, and this this is uh, the code spectra adjusted for uh, adjusted for uh, the field measurements. Uh, we also have uh, uh, something called the modified design, and this is again the same uh, spectra. Uh, but the coefficients were adjusted according to our uh, our measurements. So we used 50 percentile values uh, of the wind parameters. And we also uh, used uh, something called the conservative uh, wind field. And this is 95 percentile values uh, for turbulence intensities and conditional uh, uh, in a conditional sense of turbulence intensity and coherence uh, parameters. So if you compare the, the acceleration response, uh, the predicted response with the measured response, this is what we get. So typically if we use uh, either of the uh, three uh, 
design uh, curves without considering the variability of the wind, we get something like uh, curves like this in the middle of the scatter. Uh, here we have a we have a problem because uh, because of the neglecting the uh, cable load, but uh, typically we get uh, we get the curves uh, in the middle of the scatter. But if we use the conservative approach, and this is just, this is this is very rough uh, for now, but if you, if you it means that if you consider the variability in the wind field, so you can get uh, better design curves. So this concludes uh, the second paper, and what we saw is that the design curves estimated an average. Uh, average of the measured response, they were in the middle of the scatter. Uh, the curves were exceeded by many recordings, so this is not uh, a desirable uh, condition. And because of that, the variability uh, should be accounted for, and the conservative approach gave uh, better design curves. So, the third and uh, fourth papers now. In those two papers, uh, we pred we compared the measured and predicted responses. So uh, the first one uh, will be a one-hour stationary moderate wind event. Uh, we will compare the analytical and experimental results for that. And the second case will be a complete 13-hour uh, long storm. So for the one hour event, uh, this was recorded on November uh, 2015. We selected this uh, particular recording intentionally because this was exceptionally stationary and uh, the wind flow was perpendicular to the bridge axis. So this is uh, sort of agreeing with the, with the assumptions we do in the, uh, in the predictions. And the uh, wind speed was uh, reasonably high, uh, around 14.3 meters per second. And we used the same uh, prediction method uh, that I described earlier. But instead, we used the measured spectra directly from the measurements. So this is the time series of turbulence and wind direction. You can see that this is uh, this is uh, one hour long, and it, it is very stationary. You also see that. Uh, the main wind direction here is uh, the mean direction is perpendicular, and that is also uh, rather stationary. Then we compared the responses, and, and what we saw was actually uh, quite surprising that uh, the discrepancy between measurements and predictions were uh, really high. So you can see, for example, for the torsional response, you have up to 60% discrepancy, and uh, these are also high for the lateral and vertical responses. So the predictions uh, highlight uh, quite large differences between uh, measured and measured responses. Then we also uh, analyzed uh, a storm event, and this was uh, this was called Storm Tour. This was uh, this storm happened in uh, January 2016, and strong winds hit the bridge uh, in 30 around 30 meters per second uh, mean wind speed and 37 meters per second of uh, gusts were measured. Uh, here you can see the time series of the mid-span uh, gust speed uh, for, for, for the entire storm. And you can see uh, there's also we have some non-stationary uh, events, especially in the built-up uh, phase of the storm and the, and the passing uh, of the storm. So, uh, some of the turbulence characteristics here. First, the turbulence intensity. You can see that uh, you have unreasonable uh, estimations for the very non-stationary events, and these are uh, expected, of course. 
but do you have a, a rather uh, uh, more stable behavior uh, during the storm uh, for for the turbulence intensity but for the length scales this is not the case you have uh, again very high randomness very high scatter uh, and the 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 measured values were exceeding the recommended values from both N400 and ESDU so uh, these are these are uh, very sensitive to signal stationarity uh, therefore they exhibit very high randomness so it is uh, it is hard to uh, use them in design really uh, so if we look at the one-point spectra, again, we, we have this uh, spectral formula uh, and we have this spectral coefficient uh, A. And if we plot this for the storm, uh, you see uh, some scatter, but uh, normally the average value was uh, was very similar to what Kaimal uh, suggested. And you have uh, some ups and downs, but it's, it's, it's sort of... Uh, uh, stable. The vertical uh, is even uh, more stable, and this is the. This shows the behavior uh, along the span. So you have, for example, higher higher uh, values of the coefficient uh, in the southern side uh, for the U component and for the W component it was uh, higher in the mid span so this this highlights some uh, some in uh, non uniformities uh, along the span so you don't have the same flow of, uh, at all the points of the bridge so then uh, the last thing is the normalized cross, spec cross spectra so you have your decay coefficient here and this means uh, higher values of this means uh, lower spanwise correlation so this was also for the u component uh, rather stable uh, here you can see a comparison between uh, the n400 suggestion and uh, and the measurements uh, and ho n400 in this case gave uh, a non-conservative uh, suggestion and for the W component, the vertical turbulence, you see that uh, there are some uh, there are some uh, scatter here, uh, quite high values for some of the 10-minute recordings, but in general, also uh, you see that uh, it it is around 10 uh, or so. So uh, these are the recordings of the dynamic response uh, at the mid-span. So lateral, vertical, and torsional accelerations. You see these uh, peaks here, and these are uh, coincident with, with the uh, with the gusts uh, in the wind recording. So these are uh, rapid responses to the gusty wind. And here I give the comparison between the measured and predicted response. And this is the acceleration response. So these are actually uh, not that bad except for the vertical acceleration. For vertical acceleration, the analysis uh, gave lower estimates of the response. And this is, uh, this is uh, problematic. It's not safe. Uh, but for the lateral and uh, torsional responses, we got quite good uh, predictions. Uh, the displacement response is uh, also similar, so uh, we don't see uh, uh, much difference. So uh, looking at accelerations is just as good. And if we plot them against the uh, mean wind speed, uh, uh, this is what we see. So for the vertical uh, acceleration, we have uh, we have a problem, that is for sure. Uh, for the others, uh, we get the scatter. We for for all the responses actually, we get the scatter. 
uh, we get the variability, but uh, for the vertical, we have a uh, underestimation of the response. Uh, the displacement response, again, is very similar. So the main findings from here are that the predictions are challenging. So we uh, observed large discrepancy for even a stationary perpendicular recording. We also uh, observed some non-stationary features uh, for the storm, and these should be investigated further, maybe. Uh, we see we saw high discrepancy in the vertical response, and this also uh, should be investigated. Why is this uh, happening? Uh, and also, we tried uh, to include the non-uniform wind profiles on the predictions, but it uh, this did not improve the results uh, significantly. So the last paper, here we tried to devise a probabilistic model to account for the effects of uh, variable turbulence characteristics. So that is the uh, essence of this uh, PhD study, that we saw this uh, huge variability in the turbulence characteristics which is a particular uh, result of the topography of the Norwegian fjords. And now we, we want to suggest uh, a model that could take into account this in, in the predictions. So we used probability distributions and correlations of parameters. And we did the validation uh, in the measurement range. And we also did some measure, uh, simulations for the design wind speed. So wind field modeling is the same as we used before. We have the A coefficient here. We have the standard deviation of U and W components, and we have uh, uh, the K coefficients, uh, the DK coefficients for the spanwise correlation. So if we look at the turbulence uh, parameters, these six parameters, we see that some of them are dependent on the wind speed. Uh, but some of them are not, so uh, this also should be considered. Uh, we also see a dependence on the wind direction on top of the dependence of the wind speed. Uh, there is also the, uh, this is due to the effects of uh, complex topography, of course. So ideally, what we would want uh, would be uh, dividing uh, this data into many sectors representing different directions and different topography, but even our data is quite ex extensive, it is not uh, infinite, so we, we have to stop somewhere. So we decided to just use east and west as uh, different directions. So here uh, you can see the statistical properties of these uh, six parameters. So you have the probability distributions on the diagonal, and the correlations of uh, correlations on the off diagonals. So you can see some of them can be considered independent, but some of them are highly dependent to each other. So <clears throat> then, uh, then we also saw that these are uh, log normally distributed again. So. If you represent these parameters by log normal distributions, you have uh, two parameters of the log normal distribution, and these are the scale parameter and the, yeah, these mu and uh, sigma parameters. Uh, and uh, these add up to 12 parameters. And on top of that, you have the correlation coefficient matrix. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, 36 uh, parameters. So on top of uh, on top of the log normal distribution parameters, this adds up to 48 parameters in total. And if you estimate these 48 parameters, this gives you the full statistical description of the turbulence field. So this is the correlation matrix that we obtained from the data. And you can see that uh, you have a lot of zeros, you have a lot of uncorrelated uh, variables. This makes things easier, of course. Then we simulated uh, random wind fields using uh, uh, in the in the in the range of the data and compared it with the data. So you have uh, we we used the uh, random. Uh, 
number generators, uh, and we assume that these are log normal distributed correlated random variables. So if you look at the comparison of the measured and simulated uh, data, you, we can see that we, uh, we have a good representation of it, of the real case. So you have the same for the other parameters, and we then we did uh, simulations for uh, the design wind speed, with, which was 39 meters per second for the Hardanger Bridge. We did 1,000 simulations, and you you can see here that uh, instead of having um, having a single uh, spectra like this, this is the uh, mode of the spectra. So uh, instead of this, you s you, ca you can see that uh, we represent the variability. So this is for the coherence. And uh, to summarize this paper, we can say that uh, for a 10-minute averaging interval, uh, the turbulence field can be represented well by just six para six simple parameters. This is uh, for the hard angle bridge, of course. Um, and we represented these as long normal distribution distributed correlated random variables and we conducted simulations and these were representative of the measurements. So in conclusion, I have a set of conclusions. Um, uh, so first one is concerning the wind field characteristics. Uh, here we can say that uh, these are uh, we observed variable turbulence characteristics. Uh, the integral length scales were in general problematic. They are sensitive to, to stationarity uh, and they were severely scattered. So in design, uh, it is uh, wise to, it would be wise to avoid uh, the use of those. Uh, Chimal type spectra and uh, a Devonport type normalized cross spectra were found suitable uh, to describe the wind characteristics. The second set is concerning the buffeting analysis of the bridge deck, and here we found considerable differences, and we can say that turbulence model, uh, the model and parametric uh, uncertainty in turbulence is probably not, uh, 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 not the reason, but um, we, we, it is also hard to uh, pinpoint what is the reason. So for this, we need better representation of uh, nonlinearities, admittance functions, uh, spanwise correlation of uh, buffeting forces, and also uh, damping. And then we devised the probabilistic model, and the turbulence fields were modeled with reasonable accuracy by just six parameters. This showed a good accuracy in the measurement range. And if you adopt the frequency domain approach uh, in your calculations, this, this, this model is fast, easy, and suitable for uh, the use in reliability uh, frameworks, performance-based design and assessment, and also long-term extreme uh, response prediction. And this concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you for, for listening. And thank you, Axel, for a very good presentation. Thank you, Shirst. Um, so, if anyone wants to ask a question, you could either unmute your microphone or you could write questions uh, in the commentary field. Okay, I don't hear anyone. So. <laughs> Uh, I will just ask a, a simple question. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of result and you have had a lot of strong winds uh, during this period. What was the most surprising result? Uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, surprising things. The first uh, surprising thing, this was more of a surprise for Ule because he spent... Uh, uh, he spent his PhD doing a uh, very uh, detailed analysis uh, of the response. Uh, the first one was seeing that the response was uh, extremely scattered in real life. So <laughs> this was uh, something uh, uh, 
you you don't expect as uh, people running simulations on in front of the computer so this was uh, this was very surprising the second one especially well, well this is uh, of course uh, maybe not so surprising for uh, uh, for others but the, the discrepancy between the predicted and measured responses so actually we can't predict uh, the response with the current uh, methods all that well uh, so this was uh, another uh, unfortunate <laughs> surprise <laughs> yeah okay Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, do you hear me? Uh, barely. Speak up. Uh, we are in a room with two people, so I don't know where is the micro. <laughs> okay, but just continue. We hear you. Yeah, Etienne, I can okay. hear you. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations for your PhD friends. Thank you. Uh, I had no the occasion to tell you that, but uh, great job. Uh, I had a question about one of your slides. Uh, it's a technical question, short one. Uh, I saw you had uh, the turbulence intensity IV, which was much lower than IU. Yes. Do you have any explanation for that? Uh, it's it's probably the uh, the effect of. Uh, mountains uh, just uh, because uh, if you if you think that the wind is uh, along the fjord you have these very high mountains uh, on the sides that sort of channel the flow so you don't have much uh, turbulence in that direction that's the only so it's it's again the topography I assume so it's it's very unusual uh, uh, compared to the open terrain but uh, I guess that's the reason okay. okay do we have another one doesn't seem like people are ready to ask questions. <laughs> it might also be because it was a very good presentation, Axel, and uh, most of the things are very clear, and those things who are not very clear are very difficult. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, anyone can uh, contact me later if they want to ask questions, uh, either uh, people uh, seeing it live or from the... Uh, recording uh, it's it's easy to reach me so <laughs> uh, they can ask me uh, later as well yes so uh, please contact Axel if you have any more questions uh, I would just like to remind everyone that next Friday we will have a somewhat similar presentation it will be Bartosz uh, presenting his PhD work uh, so you are most welcome back next Friday at 10 o'clock also. And then I think uh, I will just let you know that the recording will be online approximately after 12 o'clock today. And uh, thank you everyone for participating and Axel for presenting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>